Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 36 of Talent Dad. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Scanson. And today we have the privilege of conversing with a true talent in the world of education. She's an English teacher turned principal, uh, guiding force behind two nationally recognized schools and a dynamic leader who champions the art of effective communication and likability. So named the 2022 South Dakota Region 1 High School Principal of the Year, uh, Lisa Perry has not only made a significant impact in the classroom, but also on stages uh, across the country presenting on her expertise on master mindsets, meaningful messaging, likable leadership, uh, from co-developing the Good to Great Teacher Mentoring Program with the South Dakota Department of Ed to upcoming features on esteemed podcasts like Principal Matters, Better Leaders, Better Schools, Lisa's contributions to education and leadership continue to inspire many. So Lisa... That is your introduction today. Welcome to Talent Ed. We're thrilled to have you here. How could I be anything but thrilled after hearing all of those nice things that you said about me, Eric? Thank you. It's just a pleasure to be here with you and your listeners. Love it. Well, um, Lisa, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, you know, what are you doing these days? And, uh, you know, maybe even where are you located? Where are you talking to us from today? Sure. Well, I'm going to start way back, and one thing I like to say about myself is that I was raised in nursing homes, and I've spent my life in K-12, and that's true. My dad was a nursing home administrator. They call them long-term health care facilities now, but when I was coming up, it was a nursing home, and he was an admin, and my mom was a nurse, and my brother and I uh, grew up around Edna's and Ethel's and Frank's and Herbert's, and I didn't know it, but at the time, I was learning so much about what I would need in ed leadership. Um, my dad dealt with a very vulnerable population, and mm -hmm. that was people's parents. And now I deal with a very vulnerable population. I deal with people's children. And so I was learning at his knee without even knowing it. Um, we kind of uh, traversed the country. I was born up in North Dakota, lived in Kansas, moved to New Mexico, and then came back up to South Dakota the summer before my freshman year of high school. And I, I like to point that out, too, because I've got a special connection to kids who are new in school. I was new in school a lot, and it's not easy to be new in school. So all of you educators out there, and especially those who are like my husband, who was born into and raised in the same place and, and didn't mm -hmm. move until his adulthood, just know that you got to check in on those new kids. Some of them are fine, but some of them could use a little TLC. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, I uh, uh, moved up to South Dakota, um, went to school at the University of South Dakota, got an English ed degree, went on later and got my master's in ed administration, and I have been in the same um, home for 30 years and have taught in the same district for 21. And so proud to be an educator, proud to be a South Dakotan and excited to talk uh, today with you. Well, thank you for filling in the blanks, Lisa. I think, uh, I, you know, I do have one question. Growing up in a nursing home then, did you get to play a lot of gin rummy? Oh, yeah. You got to play yeah. a lot of, like, you know, all the card games. Yeah, we did a lot of bingo. We watched a lot of Lawrence Welk. Mm. Um, <laughs> what I remember too is my brother and I, my dad, we would call in the middle of the night. A nurse aide couldn't come in or a, la the, a laundry, you know, dry washer dryer wasn't working. So my brother and I would get dragged in. We'd fall asleep on the plastic couches. And they're plastic for a reason. And I remember just like we would just peel our faces off uh -huh. of those in the morning. And I'd go to school with like a red mark. Like, oh, uh, I'm sure people wondered if I got smacked. Or what? I mean, it was the '70s and '80s, so life was different then. Sure. And uh, no, I had just been stuck to a plastic couch for about eight hours. So lots of lots of good memories and a wonderful way to grow up. Um, not traditional at all, but definitely wonderful. And a affectionado of tapioca pudding, maybe. Yeah, a lot of that. God, I saw a lot of meals going to blenders and come back out, and that's still kind of like mm. gets my gag reflexes going a little bit. Nasty. <laughs> Yeah, it's not good. Not good. Well, let's get into the educational part. You you said yeah. you transitioned from a veteran English teacher to PK-12 principal. Yeah. You've become a pillar in promoting these things, master mindsets and moves. Yeah. 
Can you said sh shed some light on what uh, what these mindsets and moves are, and uh, maybe how you can revolutionize the way education uh, educators uh, approach their roles? Sure. Well, I, I like to say other people have masterminds and I have master mindsets. And I am 100% convinced that the way I think about things um, absolutely determines the way I experience things and the way other people experience me. And so some of the mindsets that I go into situations with, and particularly conflicted situations, one thing I make myself remember is that um, I can't expect myself out of other people. So often, we get really rooted, grounded mm -hmm. in the way we see things and the way we behave. And there are millions of ways to do this life well and to do this life in ways that should not um, you know, invite other people's judgment. But so often we're tempted to say, well, I would have gotten back to you right mm -hmm. away. So why didn't you get back to me right away? I would have um, asked you these three questions, but you didn't ask me anything at all. Why didn't you? No, we cannot expect ourselves out of others. Another thing I like to tell myself is in education and in long-term healthcare, it is always personal. People are afraid. Mostly it's fear that, that is behind people, you know, uh, quote unquote, coming at us. And people are afraid and it is personal. But Eric, that doesn't mean it's about us. And whenever I'm on the receiving end of somebody's barrage of fear, which is wrapped up in anger or wrath, mm -hmm. I remind myself that this probably has nothing to do with me and everything to do with what they're experiencing and what's being triggered in them. And then the last one I'll share that this is a really important mindset is that the windshield is bigger than the rear view mirrors for a reason. And the rear view mirror is very important because we have to acknowledge what's behind us. We need to kind of keep an eye on what's behind us. We got to learn from what's behind us, but dang it, the looking forward at what's coming is healthier and more beneficial for everyone involved. And so you can't live in yesterday if you are going to be an educator. It's There's just too much emotion around it. We've got to be able to move on. And I always say, you know, yeah, a lot of people move on, but they hold on and you can't. Sometimes you got to move on and let go. Moving on and holding on, um, those two things are going to be, you know, in, in friction with each other as time goes on. Oh my gosh, I hope I get this right. I just saw this quote, Lisa, that that in the fall, the trees are a great reminder that it's okay to let go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and um, you know, that change can be a beautiful thing too. You know, um, people are afraid of change and, and people like to hold on to what is currently, but the leaves change. And it's one of the most beautiful times of the year, yes. one of the most beautiful pictures that nature presents us. And then, yeah, at some point it's time to let go. Um, I'm no gardener. I'm no green thumb. In fact, I'm a brown thumb. But I was deadheading some plants that my mother-in-law gave me this summer. And it occurred to me that it was very important to pop off those old dead heads in order to encourage, allow for new growth. New growth. There's a metaphor in there for us. There's a metaphor in there for us. And I got to say, teacher, I really appreciate the uh, the windshield rear view mirror uh, analogy i'm I'm gonna use that going forward yeah please do please do uh you have been behind the the helm of both a 21 national blue ribbon elementary school and in 2020 esea distinguished elementary school that's no small feat what would you say are some of the core principles or strategies that led to being recognized or noticed for your efforts well anybody in school leadership knows it has way less to do with us and more to do with the with the teachers. It is about the teachers who are in the classrooms every day. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to hire the right people. And you have to hire people who are, you know, it's so much more important to me that somebody is a people person than a content expert. Because I, when I was 21 years old and started teaching, I was a people person and didn't know nearly enough about English to be a teacher. In fact, I knew embarrassingly little and I, I probably owe a lot of my past um, students an apology, but, but I've grown in that way. And my natural inclination to care about others and their experiences and to grant others grace has led to my success in this field. And so it's really important to choose people who are gonna be committed to their students. And then it's important to let them do their work. Um, the other thing that's really critical 
And I'm very fortunate to have a school board and a, and a superintendent in a community that's supportive of the school. But we, we are able to, we choose to hire a healthy number of paraprofessionals so that teachers can um, get support for students who need additional support so they can break up larger groups into smaller groups. Uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint individual needs when you're standing in a, a you know in room in a room in front of 22, 21, mm -hmm. 20 people. But when you've got that second ad adult in the room who can circulate, who can pull a small group, uh, that makes all the difference in the world. And that's not me. That's me advocating for these things that the teachers need. And then it is a community, a system, a board, a superintendent who say, "We hear you. We know that you're doing good work." We're going to continue to give you what you're asking for because we believe in you. That's amazing. You you put staff first. Uh, that's such an important yeah. part of uh, leadership. Yeah. Uh, speaking of putting staff first, uh, you were involved in Good to Great Teacher Mentoring Program uh, in in the the great state of South Dakota. Great so, state. Yes. Your neighbor. Um, your neighbor. We're neighbors. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Let's talk about this nurturing of the next generation of educators. What are some of the key elements in, of the successful mentorship relationship? And maybe how do you see that uh, program impacting the future of not just South Dakota's educational landscape, but, you know, maybe, you know, what does mentoring look like across the nation right now? Right. Well, I'm really proud of South Dakota. We've actually got two phases of mentorship. One is for years one and two uh, service teachers. I'm involved in the co-creation and the facilitation of years three through five. And um, in years three through five, we put an emphasis on communication. Uh, and that would be communication with your coworkers, communication with your administration, communication with your students and communication with families. And I think everything starts there. Um, you know, we get to know each other through the ways that we communicate or in the ways that we tap out of communicating. And, and I like to say, you cannot not communicate. Mm -hmm. If you are ever not communicating, that is communication. And it's as loud or maybe even louder as a response is. And so that's really important for, I think, early service teachers to understand. Um, we also talk a lot about engagement. And I really like to focus on small incremental changes. I'm a big fan of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. I would, if you're, if your listeners are readers, they should read the whole book. If they're not, they should cheat, go on the uh, internet, find a PDF of the main points. Because I talk to teachers about just modifying the way they ask questions. I'm not asking for an overhaul, a revolution in your classroom. I like to talk to teachers about being very mindful of the way that they engage students, because we do that 20, 30, 40 times in a class period, and that times 176 days of school is an awful lot of change. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little change, but that repetition really does make a big difference. Um, and I also, one of my one of my really important points, and I just wrote about this on LinkedIn, is that I, I tell them that I expect them to make mistakes. I tell my new staff this, I tell my students this. Of course, you're going to make a mistake. People are so young teachers are so paralyzed like with the fear of making a mistake and i think how would you not make a hundred mistakes every day you make so many decisions you say so many things you have so many emotionally charged interactions yeah you are gonna mess up what are you gonna do in the aftermath to keep moving forward oh great advice if uh, if you are a a baby teacher, maybe that's the wrong term, baby teacher, new teacher, however you want, want to say it. It's all, we we love you, baby yeah, teachers. We need you. <laughs> we need you. Um, those we are some great you. words of advice. Uh, you've expanded your expertise beyond that K-12 space. You've presented to various professions, states. How do the principles of meaningful messaging and likable leadership transcend across industries? Well, Everybody, not everybody, but typically 99.9% uh, .9 of people do rely on communication for their work, to get their own work done, to, to meet others' needs and to have their own needs met. Maybe that's the best way I want to say it, whether that's professionally or personally. And so there's nowhere you're going to escape messaging. Um, I just spoke this summer to the, Nas or the South Dakota Telecommunications Association, and we talked a lot about that, about customer service, which if I can just step back for one second, administrators, you are in the customer service business. Mm -hmm. 
your stakeholders are customers. And you know what? When I graduated from high school in 1990, this was not as true. If I lived in Howard, South Dakota, and if you lived in Howard, South Dakota, you went to school in Howard, South Dakota. Now we've got online, we've got homeschool, we've got open enrollment, kids are in, Choices out. Choices everywhere. You're, you know what? Just like Burger King can lose a customer to McDonald's, you're going to lose a customer to the district next door if you aren't meeting people's needs. I'm not talking about letting somebody scream at you, mm -hmm. manipulate you. I'm not talking about being abused, but we do need to understand that kids have and families have a lot of options for an education that didn't used to be available. And so we've got to message well and likability. Likability is so, so important. It is a superpower. And when you show up in a way that makes other people feel valued and trusted, and this doesn't mean you have to fawn all over them right. and that you've got to sacrifice yourself, but and, and, and it's an eight to me. I can tell it's an eight to you, Eric. Most people who go into education, healthcare, other, you know, human touch professions, we just, we, we operate that way. We care about others and how they feel. And that is an essential component of, of leading a school and leading it well. Otherwise, people are not going to feel comfortable trusting their children to us. Mm -hmm. uh, let's switch gears. I actually want to ask you some fun questions. Lisa, are you ready? I, I hope so. I'm going to take a drink here. My okay. um, we've kind of talked about your experience uh, of uh, veteran experience. How, how would you like to label it? Like you've been doing it for a while. Yeah, old grizzled veteran. I think. Okay, old grizzled veteran. Later. I like that. Um, so having being uh, having been an an old grizzled veteran for quite some time, you've witnessed the evolution of classroom trends mm -hmm. from probably slap bracelets to fidget spinners. Um, what was the one classroom fad that you secretly enjoyed or found amusing over the years? One classroom fad. I don't know if this is a classroom. Do you know Heads Up 7-Up? Yeah. Don't you feel like every substitute teacher ever mm -hmm. spent the last 15 minutes of class playing Heads Up 7-Up? 100%. And I and was a sub for a semester. Yeah. I'm through thumbs up. Yeah. You got to check the shoes. Email Eric and me if you don't know what we're talking about. Uh, but when I was a sub and I graduated in December, so I subbed for a semester before I became a teacher. And I do remember um, being a student who got to play a little heads up seven up and I'm guilty of even using that time. And, but you know, here's the thing. Now with phones being so ubiquitous mm -hmm. in schools, I, I do stuff like that, not to waste time, but because I'm, I'm trying to facilitate yeah. human and real it's interaction. Not it is not wasted time no and and you know maybe back when everybody did talk all the time it was connected it was but now it's got a whole new purpose it does and the purpose is you know being together in a moment instead of 20 people in a room and everybody is experiencing a different moment if you're playing heads up seven up then you're together in a moment and that yes. is too rare too rare so maybe it's time for that one to come back i haven't thought about that for a while but that's an old bring it game. back lisa bring it back <laughs> Bring it back. Uh, let's. So we know you're an expert, an expert in this idea of likable leadership. But on on a lighter note, if you were to host Principals Got Talent, oh, yeah. what hidden talent would you surprise everyone on stage with? What What can you do, Lisa, that we we don't know about? Gosh, that's a really good question. Uh, if you gave me like a rack of clothing, I could put together. 16 different outfits with five different pieces i'm a mixer and a matcher that is a talent yeah i've got one daughter who's pretty good at that too so i can i can make i can make a lot out of a little and not in the kitchen just in the closet <laughs> just in the I closet have 40 ingredients and not be able to make one thing in the kitchen but i could take four four clothing items and create some create some outfits that's that's a good skill that's <laughs> a good skill Especially in a teacher's budget, right? In the teacher's you budget. Make, you got to make it stretch. Uh, last one. Lisa, every educator has had that one memorable moment when something unexpected happens in the classroom or during your day. Can you share, do you have a lighthearted or funny classroom incident that still makes you chuckle to this day? You know, I have one that, that makes me really, really happy. 
Um, I had a student surprise me, return to school 15 years, eh, 10 years after graduation. And he was a student who, when he graduated, I worried. I, I, I worried about what life would look like. Um, and I liked him. And, and, and so I had a lot of trepidation about his future. And he showed up, looked fantastic, and, and wanted me to know what he, he was a business owner. He was an, a successful entrepreneur. He'd found a wonderful life partner. And he want, he thought it was important that I know because he knew I had kind of worried and, mm -hmm. it, and it bothered him that I worried. And he came back to share that. And I, you know, that was so affirming. And at the same time, it was just such a good lesson that when they leave me, they're not done. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just beginning. But sometimes you watch a graduating senior and your your heart's a little heavy because you want more for them than, than you think life is going to give. And he was an excellent example of that. Uh, yeah, I'm 18 years old and I'm not done. Like I'm a frozen pizza. I've been in the oven at 400 for five minutes and I just need a few more minutes in the oven, Mrs. Perry. I'm going to be mm -hmm. fine. He was more than fine. He was more than fine. I'll never forget that. That was, it was incredible. Well, how great that he came back and he closed the loop for yeah. you. Like to recognize yeah. that and, and, oh, and like close it. I like the way it. you said that. Yeah, he did. He closed the loop and it was a loop that was open for me. Um, and I have, you know, I still worry about some of my kids. Um, but he, he, he kind of ignited a little bit of hope that still kind of burns for the mall because yeah, good things can happen outside mm -hmm. of my eyesight, outside of my purview. And then when he came back, that was just a, that was incredible. Hmm. Well, Lisa, we've covered a lot of topics today from making mistakes to mm -hmm. um, likable leadership to um, heads up seven up, which might've been our greatest <laughs> breakthrough today is that that needs that to come was, back. That one was very deep. That um, was very deep. Do you, before we wrap up, do you have any advice or a final call to action for our listeners who are are listening to you today? Uh, you know, just one final mindset I think that I carry that I'd close with is that, you know, the human brain is such that we always have to know, you know, we got to know, we don't, we don't like go back to closing the loop, right? We like to have the loop closed. And, and when we don't know what's behind something, we, we really are quick to tell ourselves a story. And, and so often that story is not true. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a quick responder to an email. So Eric, if I email you, this is going to put some pressure on you, Eric. But if I email you and I haven't heard back from you in three days, I'm going to catastrophize that. And I'm going to pretend, you know, in my mind, you and I are never going to speak again. Yeah. I've done something to alienate mind. you. Go home. I've done something to alienate you professionally. And, and you know, you're just never going to be uh, in my life again. Yeah, right, right. And, and just stop and and don't tell yourself a story that isn't true and ask questions you know ask the questions mm. that you need an answer to be i think sometimes we suffer in silence i like what you just said be curious don't suffer in silence ask the question and um it just there's a lot of things we can't control a lot of people bring you know tumultuous situations into our lives we don't need to create any for ourselves there are plenty out there plenty out there well, Lisa, what an enlightening conversation today. Uh, oh, nice this, this has been um, a big thank you to you for sharing your wealth of knowledge, your de your delightful insights with us today. Um, for our listeners who are inspired by Lisa, which if you're not, come on, get on the bus. I mean, get, get there, get there. Um, Lisa would love to share her expertise with you in an event that. or at your institution or your district. Um, she is available for booking. You can contact her directly or you can contact us through School Pro, either one. And right. then um, simply click on the booking portal link that I'm going to put in the uh, description to this episode uh, for That's easy great. booking. I, um, I just really hope our paths cross. I'd love to meet some of these fine people who are listening to us today. That'd absolutely. be great. As always, everybody, remember to stay PKS, which is positive, kind, and supportive. And until next time, this is uh, Dr. Eric Skansen signing off from Talent Dad. Everybody stay inspired. <laughs>